to start with sort of the end of my comments yesterday. Yesterday, when we were talking about the next brain, I gave a lot of emphasis to uh, two things. One that I openly stated, which had to do with a preoccupation with life systems, so that when we talk about the brain uh, and the nervous system in general, we do not forget this reality, which is that brains are almost an afterthought of nature. They came late in the, in the story of life, uh, and they picked up on many, many themes that were already very important themes during the, um, during the progression of life in evolution for billions of years. And I think this is very important because uh, it, it, it sort of uh, adds to the notion of consistency as we evolve living organisms. Um, the other thing which I actually did not mention, but I think it would be relevant to the conversation of this morning, uh, we have a lot of interventions that were on this list that we were picking from, um, but there is no mention of theory. So when we talk about uh, successes or failures in uh, neuroscience, whether we're dealing with diseases or we're just dealing with primary understanding of processes, I think that it's very, very critical that we don't just talk about methods, but we talk about the theoretical approach that we are following, because it makes all the difference uh, how you conceive of these processes. And of course, many of the things that interest the people around this table have to do with mental processes, have to do with unnamed uh, things such as mind, consciousness, uh, the feeling process, which is now a little bit more uh, acknowledged, but was not acknowledged before, and has not been acknowledged through a good part of the history of neuroscience for very obvious reasons, is that the thing that we are most concerned with are fundamental, very rich cognitive processes that have developed hugely in humans, and so the things that we're using right now, uh, using language, that I'm using to transmit ideas and you to understand those ideas, uh, using memory, using reasoning, using perception, um, using a variety of true cognitive processes, but once again, they obfuscate this huge elephant in the room or this huge elephant inside of us, which has to do with life processes, with risk to life, with the ability to identify risk and correct it with feeling processes. And those are very important, and they are, in fact, the processes that are running our operation, whether we want it or not. Uh, and I think one thing that is very distinct about humans in distinction uh, with other creatures that came before is that we have minds. Uh, we have minds with, uh, with a spatiality to them. We have representations in different sensory modalities. There are metrics to those representations. They can be connected with neural maps, which our cerebral cortex does galore, but not only the cerebral cortex, because there are also spatial maps occurring in brain stem, for example. And those, those maps are the basis for uh, outright images, explicit images that we use and that we're using right now in order to represent language, to represent concepts and so forth. And which, to the best of our knowledge, bacteria can't do. So if you go to the world of single cells or with a few cells, the world that is devoid of nervous systems, uh, you do not find anything that corresponds to the explicit mental representations that we have. And that entails something very subtle. Uh, and this is totally open to discussion. Uh, is it the fact that bacteria, which I think, do not have feelings, do not have the possibility of consciousness, although they have the precursors to consciousness, in which case it's only to creatures with nervous systems such as we are that we have this fantastic possibility, which is accessing feeling, even if you don't pay much attention to them anymore, but the feelings that, the, I'm thinking especially of the primary homeostatic feelings such as well-being, um, malaise, 
pain, uh, the feelings that go with emo complex emotional processes such as joy, fear, anger, compassion, uh, all of those feelings that in fact, whether we want it or not, are running our life. So, uh, I, uh, I, I didn't know that you were going to uh, um, print the paper, which is good, so that you have it there. Uh, saves me a lot of time, and I would just say the following things. So, um, th this paper uh, th that uh, just came out, uh, and which I'm actually very pleased to see people ha have been reading and copying and talking about, and it has been out for three weeks, um, is really about the process of life and life regulation in connection with a world that I find fascinating, which is the world of artificial intelligence. And it has an interesting story in the sense that for a long time, and actually I think I remember in one of the meetings we had here in Madrid, uh, I m made the point that uh, uh, machines, especially the way machines are built currently, uh, with hard materials that are invulnerable, uh, that uh, you, know, you need to take an axe to them if you want to destroy your robot, uh, those machines are not going to have feelings and therefore they're going to be devoid of the possibility of feeling, which also entails another thing that is very close, is the possibility of consciousness. Um, and uh, uh, what the, 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 so the, the, at first I was this agnostic that said, well, I'm not interested, I love machines, but machines are never going to be like me, they're not going to have feelings and consciousness. And then we started thinking, well, why not do something interesting, which would be to propose to introduce vulnerability to machines in a double hope. One is that it might serve as a test platform, as an experimental platform for the study of feeling and consciousness, and that interests me a lot because my prim primary interest is research. Um, but the other is that it might create something quite intriguing, which is a more intelligent machine. Because when we think about what is so great about us and about humans in general, but other living creatures, is that because of the conditions under which those creatures have evolved, uh, they have a purpose, quote-unquote, and that purpose has to do with a concern that is unstated, because most of them cannot state any concern anyway, uh, but it's the concern for their own life. What machines, what, what living machines do, beginning with bacteria without any nucleus and without any great complexity, is be concerned with their lives and protect their lives come hell or high water. And that's why they're still here, and that's why they're so successful. So, wouldn't it be intriguing if, instead of armoring a, a device uh, with a lot of complexity, which is by, by uh, design and statement, is uh, cognitive complexity, why not do the opposite? and in fact weaken the design and create a vulnerability, create risk to an organism, a designed organism, and in that case hope that by having a tremendous amount of intellectual capability you would find uh, across an evolution of that organism a possibility of defending itself and a possibility of being more intelligent because it would have adaptability. And it might be taken by humans, for example, in a more uh, sort of welcoming way. And we had all sorts of interesting applications that we were thinking. So th this is basically the, the, the dream and the idea that was behind the paper. And finally we wrote it and it's at least pleasant that people don't find the idea completely stupid to, to begin with. Um, then I just wanted to connect with one more thing. Is this imperative of, of feeling is a very important one. I'm very happy that Manos Sakiris is here because he's part of a new breed of people in neuroscience that has actually been concerned with feelings and with affect. And I tell you, it's a minority. Uh, I, I like to remember people, remind people that when in 1995, 
uh, I proposed, together with Joseph Ledoux, a session on emotions at the Society for Neuroscience. That was the first time there was anything in any symposium of the Society for Neuroscience that had one bit to do with affect. And listen, here we are discussing such things as Alzheimer's disease, depression, a variety of mental illness. Where were people thinking that those things were coming from? You know, what, what's at stake in those conditions? You know, it's not, it's not calculus. You know, what's at stake is primary feelings and the way you organize them or disorganize them. Uh, so, uh, I, I want you to connect this process of feeling with the process of consciousness. So, the value of feeling is that, again, whether you want it or not, you're constantly being run by feelings. And I'm, you, know, you don't need to be touchy-feely. You have to think that what you're doing the entire day, um, prior to or in the background of things such as thinking about what you're going to do and writing a paper, making a telephone call, you know, closing a deal, you are constantly thinking about whether you are hungry or thirsty or you have, you know, you broke a leg like, you know, one of our uh, um, participants has broken a leg and that thing, I bet, you caused a lot of pain and you're defending yourself from pain. So you're being governed by this and you're being governed by other things that give you a feeling of calm or a feeling of anxiety or actually motivate you to write a paper or defend yourself in an argument and so forth. It's just that it is not in the forefront of your mind, but it is there. So yesterday, uh, with one of our esteemed colleagues, we were having a conversation about memory, and then at a certain point we were having a conversation about consciousness, and you said very clearly, I don't see what the heart problem is and why we have this famous heart problem of consciousness. And quite frankly, I don't think there is a heart problem of consciousness, and that's not just to irritate uh, David Chalmers. And so I wanted to tell you two things, and then I'll shut up. Um, the first is that this possibility that we have of feelings of well-being or pain that, or, or yearning for something or, or desire and so forth that really are running our lives and are under balanced control with our cognition, these feelings imply something, which is consciousness. Just think of this. If you were not conscious of your feelings, they would be of no use to you, they would not be feelings. They would be actually something that probably some early creatures have, and that because they are devoid of the conscious component, have no effect whatsoever. So feeling by necessity is conscious, and with, without consciousness it's an absurdity. It's a precursor to feeling, but it cannot be, it cannot be feeling. And and consciousness in the end, and again this returns us to the body, consciousness ends up being this possibility of having a mental experience, and that mental experience has two components that are critical. One, what could call self-reference. You have to be cautious, especially with philosophers, but when you use the word self, because they get very nervous with it, and because self has many layers, and that's obviously a, a problematic term. But it is actually a reference to self, a reference to your own body. That's what it, the, the critical thing is. So you are conscious when you have mental states, you have minds, and those minds are imbued with two important factors. First, reference to self. When you are conscious of something, you, don't, you, you, th you know that it refers to you. And what it refers to, critically, is your body, is your living body. That's, that's the thing. And it's, curiously, it's referring quite a lot to your head as well, probably because two of our most important sensory probes are located in the head. So the head ends up being a, a target of this self-reference that we have. The other thing is that inevitably, those, ex those mental experiences are accompanied by feeling. It's not that feeling may or may not be there. They have a feeling that is inherent in that process of experience. And what feeling is, is a sort of classification of the state of life at a given moment. So, at a given moment, you may be 
your homeostatic process may be in one of the uh, one of the states that is compatible with life and with life's continuation, uh, and that's good because homeostatically that's going to be favorable, um, or it may not, it may be deviating from that. And what feeling, what we call feeling, whether it is a feeling of pleasure, of pain, or whatever, is a sort of natural classification of the state of the body, of certain parts of the body, as they are fluctuating in the regulation of life. So it's a, a direct translation, but it's a direct translation that is being made in relation to a scale of values. It's being, and that's why one talks in feeling, one talks about valence. What it simply means is that it can be good or bad, uh, or, or, but generally not, not indifferent. And that's really the, the critical thing. And so, <clears throat> to make a long story short, what we wanted is to propose a class of machines that could be imbued with some of these characteristics, but the fundamental characteristic is risk to self, which really means risk to a living body, and uh, fortunately there are now a, a, a couple of new developments that make this more possible and in the end writable, uh, which is soft robotics, the fact that there are new materials that instead of being rigid like steel, uh, can be deformed and have, uh, in, you know, have actuators, have ways of being in, in more uh, viable or less viable states, and that's an interesting development. And of course, you have all the developments in machine learning that will have, you know, um, necessary in order to make this thing uh, have some depth and have some possibility of evolution. So that's that's fundamentally the idea. Uh, about the paper and the ideas of background that I wanted to present. Thank you very much. Thank you.